Hello, everybody. We're in pretty troubling times, but in these troubling times, are you experiencing peace? No worries, no anxiety, but peace and joy in your heart. Is Christ returning soon? If he is, and I believe he is, probably in my hope anyway, it's not a prediction, I'm not a prophet, but I'm hoping within 10 years. Uh, if it's longer than that, so be it. But what that means is if Christ is returning shortly, whether 5, 10, or 15 years, I, I think it's got to be at least 9 or 10 years. But if he's coming back shortly, that means that the years before that will be the time of greatest trouble the world has ever seen. You might want to hear my sermon on when will Christ return and a good review of the things that do have to happen before he returns. And uh, they're not going to be very happy times. That's the flip side of him coming back soon, is that the years before are going to be terribly troubling unless we have a great connection with God. So are you at peace with God in spite of any pain you're going through, health conditions you're going through, persecutions, troubles, uh, watching the world news? Maybe we should do less of that. I don't know. But in spite of all the bad news in your life, are you feeling at peace with God? Or are you troubled and anxious and worried and upset? Ticked off, in other words, that people use. So let's ask God's blessing on this sermon because it's about having amazing peace in our most troubling times. Father in heaven, we raise our people up to you. We come before you in Jesus' name, in Yeshua's name, that all those who believe in you, all those who believe in Yeshua, all those who are given your Holy Spirit and whom you're calling and giving the Spirit to, who will be in the first resurrection, will be your children that you're having as first fruits. I pray for them, Father, that they will hear this and they will respond to it and that they will learn to have peace. I will learn to have more peace too. I'm human, Father, too. I, I can get worried and upset and, and wondering where you are. I, I'm learning this, though, and I'm passing this on. I'm praying that the people will hear your voice, not mine, but hear your voice and Yeshua's voice, that they will hear what you say and follow you. So thank you. Bless this message. Bless the hearing and the speaking. We commend it to you in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right. So in spite of everything going on, you're at peace. You feel fine. Is that, is that where you are? In spite of the chaos and in uh, Afghanistan, in, in spite of the COVID, maybe people you know. I've known three or four people now who have died. I think it's three who have died. People I know, then I know of people who know people I know, you know, second level, um, five people who have died, uh, including a neighbor of mine right here. And so it, it's very upsetting if you focus on that. We see inflation starting to take off. And I believe by next year we'll be in double digit inflation routinely. And by the end of next year, I really believe we'll see worse inflation than in the uh, Carter years. We're energy dependent again uh, when we were independent. We're spending trillions and trillions of dollars we don't have. We're, we're keeping the borders wide open so terrorists can come right over. There probably could be terrorists among the 100,000 or plus Afghanis we brought over. Afghanistanis, I'll call them Afghanis. But one thing I must say, before we get too, too far and the troubles that are there, I speak out on policy, I, I speak out on what my preference is and what I believe God's uh, Bible tells us, but the one thing it's tempting to do that we must not do, and that is we must not be calling our president and the national leaders foul names that are not becoming the children of God. That's just not right, and I'm going to sh show you that in a second. I've spoken badly about policy, but we must remember our priority is that we follow the Lamb. He is our symbol. He is, the Lamb is our symbol. He's our, the one we follow. That's Yeshua. We're pilgrims on this earth. We need to follow the example of Yeshua, Peter, and Paul, and others who, in spite of the uh, Caesars that they had, including Nero, who was terrible, they never spoke out against those leaders. We need to follow that example. Romans 13, verses 1 and 2 in the English Standard Version. 
Let every person be subject for, uh, to the governing authorities. You're reading right here on the screen behind me. There is no authority except from God. There's no authority except from God. And those who exist that exist have been instituted by God. You may not believe that God could institute the horrible leaders that we've had in the past around the world, but for God's purposes and God's reasons, he put them there. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities, whoever plans on fighting it or whatever, going to war against it or anything like that, resist what God has appointed. Resist what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment, implying his judgment. So if you say foul things, foul names against, and I'm no fan of President Biden, I'll be clear. Okay, but it says what it says here. Every authority is there by God's will and whom God has appointed. And when we resist and speak evil of that, guess who we're really speaking evil of? So one way to peace, an extra point, not, not my five, is to do what Yeshua did and all of them did and do what Peter said to do in 1 Peter 2.17. 1 Peter 2.17, honor everybody, honor all. Love God. Love the fellowship, the brotherhood. Honor the king. Honor the king. The king at that time was Nero. Foul, horrible person. Honor him because God put him in that office. So please, children of God, let's all please knock off. Knock off the insulted, insulting name-calling that we're doing against political leaders, like them or not. It's, become, it's unbecoming of us as children of God to be doing that. So anyway, let's move on. So we know from prophecy and from the actions of the leaders that things will get a lot worse. Let's talk about having peace in these troubled times, okay? So welcome, everybody. Welcome, my brothers and sisters, to Light on the Rock. My brothers and sisters in the house of God, God's family, his household, welcome. I'm Philip Shields. I'm host and founder of Light on the Rock. And uh, remember to check out the many videos, many audios, which are different. Uh, you're going to find different sermons in the audio sermons than you will find in the video sermons. I'm keeping both up to date. The audio sermons, without having to have a video, are much easier to produce, take a lot less time. So I'm also putting out blogs, and we'll see a lot more of those coming up soon too. So next, before we get into the five points for peace, I think I need to address this thing of false assumptions. I do believe some end-time believers will be supernaturally protected. I do believe that. I do believe there will be what the Bible calls a place of safety, or what I, or at least we call a place of safety. In Revelation 3, verses 10 to 12, speaking to the 10 and 11, Revelation 3, verses 10 and 11, speaking to the church at Philadelphia, that, those type of brethren, it seems that they will be protected from the hour of trial and testing coming upon the whole earth. Revelation 12 speaks about the, the woman who was taken to her place in the wilderness and protected. And then later on, there's a remnant of the woman who didn't go to the place of safety, and they are attacked by Satan. That's the end of Revelation 12. And we know Yeshua said, Watch and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape these things that are coming to pass. That's Luke 21, 36. Others, however, unlike the uh, Philadelphian, there's another group of people called Laodicea. That type of people, if you look at the timing, he says, I'm right here. Yeshua says, I'm right here at the door, knocking on the door. Let me in. They have to be refined in the fire and purchase gold that's been refined in the fire, meaning they're going to have to go through a lot of trials and troubles. But too many people, too many of you hearing this, are putting your trust and your faith and your confidence in a place of safety or in sermons about that. I've given my own sermons. I'll give you a link to my sermon in my notes. But I'm saying to you, whether I've spoken it or others have, that's not where you should be looking. That's not where your trust should be. Your trust needs to be in Almighty God, in Him, in Yeshua. Okay? Some people read Psalm 91, especially verse, Psalm 91, verses 9 and 10. 
There shall no plague come near you, no harm shall befall you. You're not going to be touched. We know, as I'm going to show you today, that people through time, God's people through time, have been martyred, have been beheaded, have been tortured, have been persecuted, have had the diseases. So I believe that that was probably written by Moses. Many believe that. And it was to help inspire the Israelites. They may have been singing this the night of the 10th plague when the firstborn of Egypt were all being killed. And so when the death angel came and did not see the blood protecting that house, the firstborns in that household, the man and beast, were all killed. I think in context that makes a lot of sense in context of what God's people truly have gone through, okay? Hebrews 11 tells us some have been sawn in two. That's traditionally what happened to Isaiah. Some had to flee, and some were killed and martyred and so on. So obviously, yes, we can get in some serious trouble. So it's a false assumption to have your faith in a false doctrine that none of God's people will have to go through anything bad because they'll all be raptured off or taken to a place of safety or supernaturally protected, 100%, all of them, that's a false assumption. So uh, Luke 17, in fact, warns us, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. So don't be putting all your focus on getting ready to la live forever through persecution and trouble. God is our provider. God is our protector. That's where we look. Now, don't be stupid and have no provisions. Of course, here in Florida, where I live, I try to have weeks and several weeks supply of, or even months supply of food and gasoline and water and so forth, batteries and all that. But I'm not relying on those things to protect me. I'm relying on my Father in heaven, Yeshua. And Yeshua. Uh, Luke 9, verses 23, 24. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Daily. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Where's a person going who's carrying a cross? They're going to the place where they're going to be crucified. And he says daily. Deny the self. Daily let the self die. The fleshly old self, that is, that I'm talking about. We live anew in the Spirit of God. So God in the form of Yeshua died for you. He wants to know. He has to know. I think those who will be spared it are those whom God absolutely knows. No matter what I put on them, they're going to go all the way. If, they, uh, uh, if I tell them they, they have to... Uh, be martyred or beheaded, they'll say, when, Lord? And gladly, for your sake. You died for us, and we will die for you, Lord. I think that's what he, what he knows. So anyway, Revelation 20, verse 4, speaks of those who've been beheaded. Revelation 13, put this phrase up there. Revelation 13, verse 7, this beast power who's coming will make war with the saints and overcome them. Doesn't sound like they're up in heaven on some rapture or in a place of safety, all of these at least. And will overcome them. Daniel 7 verse 13 about Christ uh, coming in the clouds that he backtracks a bit to give more of the story. Uh, Daniel 7 verses 21 to 22 will put up, I was watching the same horn was, making war, horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints the, of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So, you know, the persecution is real. It's coming. Daniel 8, verse 24, the very end of it, talking about, again, this beast power that's going to take over and be a worldwide dictator. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. He shall destroy the mighty and holy people, the saints. Daniel 12, 7. 
And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. So you see why we need to know that rough times are coming and that we're going to have to go through a certain amount of it. We just have to know that. So don't be under the false assumption that if you've accepted Christ and you're a child of God, you're guaranteed no harm, no death, no, no torture, no martyrdom. That, that's just not right. When God's own son came for us, he suffered mightily. All the apostles, except John, died painful, horrible deaths, crucifixions, being beaten, being stoned, being beheaded, all of them. Paul, uh, if anyone was worthy of being protected, surely it was Paul, and yet he went through so much. He lists, you know, a number of stripes and beatings he went through and stonings and shipwrecks and all that uh, and persecution galore. Acts 14, verse 21 to 22, this was after in the city of Lystra, he had been stoned so badly they had dragged him out of the city assuming he was dead. And then some days later, Acts 14, 21, 22, we read this. When they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, I think that might have been Derby, they returned, returned, went right back to where he had been stoned and left for dead. This man's got some guts got some courage. They returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Lystra was where he was stoned and left for dead, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, saying we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Many. Other translations put it, Endure, we must endure many hardships. NIV, New Living Translation. So Yeshua tells us, now this is what Yeshua tells us on the eve of his crucifixion. Well, hours after speaking this, he, was, he would be crucified. John 15, verse 20. Remember the word I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you as well. If they kept my word, they would keep yours as well. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you as well. So five things we need to be practicing as we force to have peace. Number one, we have to trust, trust, trust God. Number one, trust him, faith in him. Another way of saying have tremendous, deep-centered faith in our great God. No matter what we're going through, trust, trust, believe, have faith in Wait on him. Do not trust in a place of safety. Do not trust in man. Know God, know Yeshua so well by his word uh, that, that, that you, know, you know you can trust him. And if God wants you protected, he'll protect you. If God wants you to go through suffering and trials, he will let you go through that for our good. It's part of preparing us to become perfect as he is perfect. I hope you hear the sermon I gave on that. Uh, will we ever be as perfect as God? Will we ever be perfect? Uh, the uh, sermon might surprise you. I hope you'll hear it all the way through uh, on perfection. If you only heard part of it and then thought you knew the rest, uh, please hear all of it. John 16, 33, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. How? In me. In me you may have peace. It's saying quite a mouthful there. In me, we have to be in Christ. And if we are in Christ, we will have peace. In the world, you'll have tribulation. But take courage, I've overcome the world. You're going to have to practice these five points. I hope you'll save this sermon somehow. And when things start getting rough and you're finding yourself being anxious, you know, I, I do that myself with other sermons, my own sermons. If I, if I start feeling anxious a year or so after giving this, I might dig this out myself because these points are true points. In me, you shall have peace. Trust comes easier when you know someone that you're putting the trust in. You get to know someone by hearing them, Bible study, lots and lots of Bible study, hearing his voice as you pray, hearing his voice as you seek to hear his voice, you will also trust someone the more you talk to that person as well. So I'm saying, pray, pray, pray like crazy. Pray first thing in the morning on your knees. Before you do anything else, seek you first 
the kings, the kingdom of God. Put him in first place. Don't let him find some little bits of pieces of time during the day or week. No, put him first every day into your life. I, I'm really making sure that's my practice. And do it last thing every day before you go to bed. You might be tired. We'll pray before you get that tired then. And several times during the day, make contact, make connection. Talk to him, praise him, thank him, listen to him. Know he loves you. Know that he's got a dream for you. He's got a brilliant destiny for you beyond what you can ever expect. 1 Corinthians 2, people love the, the verse that says, No eye has seen nor ear heard the things God's prepared for us, those who love him. It goes on to say, But God has revealed much of it at least to us. So the more you study, the more you seek him, the more you will be able to understand God has a dream for me, a destiny for me, that in spite of having to go through deep trouble like his own son had to, like Paul and the other apostles all had to, I'm looking forward to that and I trust this being. John 14, 27. Again, this was part of that final Passover dinner that he was having or the dinner he was having anyway with his disciples before he was crucified. John 14, 27. This was before he scourged, beaten, humiliated, slapped, spit on, everything. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I give you my peace. So in your prayers, ask God. I'm going to note that. Ask God in your prayers, please give me the peace of Yeshua. Please let his peace be upon me. Please help me accept it. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So the key is to be in Christ, trust him, have peace in him, accept his peace, not anything else. How much do you talk to Yeshua, by the way? Some of you think you only pray to God the Father. Yes, Yeshua said, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven. But there are also examples in Scripture where prayers were made to Yeshua. Certainly in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, there were times the one we now know as Yeshua was the one they were talking to in many cases. And so, um, not in every case, but in many cases. So he should be our peace. Our, our peace. Um, you need to talk to him because whoever talks just to the uh, father of the bridegroom, we all, you know, if I'm the bride and you're the bride, we want to talk to the bridegroom as well, right? So please, please understand that. I put a little a graphic in there. My peace, my, my sheep, I mean, hear my voice. My sheep, hear my voice. So put your trust in God. Listen to his voice. Follow him. Follow him. He will tell you what to do in these last days. He will. You've learned to hear his voice and follow him. So here's some of the things he does promise us uh, that we must remember in hard times. Romans 8, 28, that everything will work out for good. No matter how bad, how hard it is, trust that it will work out for good. You know, you've heard that scripture many times. Remember that scripture. And then he'll never allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able. Let's put it on the screen up here. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, in the uh, new Good News translation, I'll use this time. The word tri trial or tribulation or testing, uh, it's all the same Greek word here. He won't let us go beyond our limits, but he does test our limits more than you and I may want him to. I never thought I could survive losing a son and then two miscarriages after that, but we did and other things that I won't bother taking the time to go through. Just know that when you're in a trial, at the beginning you might think, I can't stand this, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Understand if you're going through it, God knows you can go through it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, every test that you have experienced is the kind that normally comes to people. But God keeps his promise. He will not allow you to be tested beyond your power to remain firm, to endure it, to remain firm. At the time you're put to the test, he will give you the strength to endure it and so provide you a way out. So when you're going through it and you think you can't make it, just keep praying to him, please, please load me up with your power, 
your faith, your peace, in spite of how terrible this is. God helps, God helps us in the severe trials. In the story of Daniel's three friends, we learn another lesson. Uh, being burned alive, what happened? The one that we now today know as Yeshua was seen walking with them in the fire. Even if you know the story, it will be good to read it again and apply it to yourself as a lesson that not only will it work out for good, not only will he not test us beyond what we're able, but he also will be in that test with us. For he was tested in like manner in all things and understands whatever you and I are going through. And he's in it, he's in it with you. You may not literally see him like Shadrach and company did, but know that that's written for our admonition. He's in it for me and for you as well. And sometimes God allows us to be in severe pain, testing and even death. But wait, God can always, God always is in the trial with us. And he'll never, never, never leave us alone in those times. I'm going to read a well-known verse in Hebrews 13, 5, but read it from the Amplified Version. Hebrews 13, 5. Let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he has said, I will never... What I'm getting at here by reading Amplified is that the, the Greek is so strong that Amplified takes these many words to try to convey what the original Greek had. Okay. I will never under any circumstances desert you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support, nor will I in any degree leave you helpless. Nor will I forsake or let you down or relax my hold on you, assuredly not. Never. Hebrews 13.5. Write that down, use it, read it from time to time. You might feel like, where is God in all of this? Why didn't God act in all of this? Why didn't God stop this? You and I need to trust him so much that we understand this kind of trust is, what, is what's necessary. So God tells us in these hard times, it's for good. He won't let us be tested beyond our ability. He's in it with us and he'll never, uh, never give us up. And how are you going to come to that? By building up that relationship. Just a second, I look at something here. Know that you know God. Know that you know God. Okay, this is all under that point of trusting God, knowing God. You, you can't trust Him unless you really know Him. Spend much, much, much more time in prayer. And your trust will go, grow. Isaiah 26, verse 3 we read, you will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you. No matter what, you keep him in perfect peace as long as we don't move our eyes. Peter started to sink when, he, when Christ called him to come out in, on the water and walk on the water. He did fine at first as long as he was keeping his eyes on Yeshua. Once he took his eyes off Yeshua, that's when he began to sink. Whose mind is stayed on you. And how could you do that? Because he trusts you. Because he trusts you. Trust in Yehovah, the Lord, forever. For in Yah, the short form of Yehovah, in Yah, Yehovah is everlasting strength. Trust in him. Keep your eyes stayed on him. Trust in him. Keep your eyes stayed on him in these difficult times. If, you're, if you've just been told that your wife has stage four cancer and has six months at most, maybe six weeks to live, keep your eyes stayed on him. If you hear that 500 Americans are killed in Afghanistan, if you hear that, or some other place, or terrorist bombings going off uh, around, around the country, keep your eyes stayed on him, not on what you're hearing. Because we trust in him. Remember, God knows everything going on in our hearts, in our lives. There's a verse I love, Psalm 131, verse 2. It says, Calm, I will calm my soul. I will calm my soul like a weaned child with his mother. And when we have perfect love for God, but you mothers should understand that. So number one, trust him. Absolutely. No matter what. 
because we've come to know him and love him, we can keep our eyes focused on him. If I stop the whole sermon there, that's enough, frankly, to help us have peace. But there's much more. Number two, let's do what Jesus did just before he was crucified. What did he do? How on earth could he have peace? He talked about my peace I give to you. Well, my second point, let's read, let's read the scripture. Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2. This is the second point. That we must take the long view past the trial of this life. Take the long view and into what God has in store for us. Uh, look at the time that you're going to be changed to spirit at the last trump, gathered up by the angels. You will have your angel come pick you up, take you to Yeshua as his bride, back up to heaven to be married. I'm pretty sure of that. Revelation 19. But notice, be looking for what I'm saying, look past this set of trials you're going through to that and to the eternity beyond that even. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, Therefore we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, he's just gone through Hebrews 11, the Hall of Faith chapter, and listed all kinds of people of God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Enoch, and Noah, and David, and so many people there, even Samson and Lot and others. Uh, Lot's mentioned elsewhere, I think. But anyway, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race set before us. Doing what? Verse 2, doing what? Looking unto Jesus, Yeshua, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of, of the throne of God. The New Living says, for the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. He says, what should we do then? Some of these guys in Hebrews 11 went through terrible times. He said, let's do what Yeshua did. That, okay, my next 8, 9, 10, 12 hours or 24 hours is going to be terrible, terrible. But I'm going to look past that to sitting with my father again in his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And the joy that I have coming to me. I can put it up, I can put up with this for this trial. If I look beyond this trial, that's point number two. Take the long view, way past the current things you're going through. Romans 8, verse 16 to 18, Paul taught the long view as well, that nothing rough should uh, ever compare with what God has in store for us. Romans 8, verse 16 and 18. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We're children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God. And joint heirs with Christ. I have a sermon, by the way, that I really recommend. It's not in my notes, so I recommend you write it down. Your or Our breathtaking destiny. Just write down two words. Breathtaking destiny. There are three-part sermon. Uh... I guarantee you, for most of you, this will be something that will blow you, blow you away. Uh, what God has in store for us. He has revealed that to us. Romans 8, verse 17. If children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him. That's part of the deal. We have to suffer and be tested and be perfected by the suffering. That we may also be glorified together. And he means with him. For I consider the sufferings of this present time not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. He goes on at the end of Romans 8, verses 35 to 39, saying nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ and the love of God. Nothing, nothing. Now, so if you don't do this point too, look beyond the suffering. Okay, my husband's going to die. My wife's going to die with this cancer or COVID-19 or whatever, unless God heals him or her, unless. But you look past that. I'll have, I know he or she will be resurrected. I know we'll be together again. I know I'll see him healed and be well. Look past all that and I'll be immortal 
and I'll have incorruption. By the way, some of you think that the resurrection is to eternal life in the flesh. That's nonsense. It's not true. This body will put on immortality and we shall be like the angels who are spirits. And we shall be like God, 1 John 3, 2, who is spirit and able to see him in his glory because we'll be glorified spirits too. So uh, the trumpet will sound and this mortality must put on immortality and we shall be changed spirit. So don't, don't believe that it's a fleshly thing forever and ever. It's just not. It's spirit life, immortal life. And I... Um, and to ponder also why Hebrews 13, verse, or I'm sorry, Hebrews 11.35, Hebrews 11.35 calls the first resurrection the better resurrection. You'll be taken up to Yeshua, zoomed up to heaven to be married, uh, meet God the Father, and before coming back to earth to reign with Yeshua for a thousand years together with him as kings and priests with him. So like Jesus, look beyond what's happening now to what's going to happen later. Point number, three, so point number two, look beyond it. Okay. Point number one is absolutely learn to trust him. Keep your eyes focused on him. Trust him. Obey him. Believe him. Don't worry. Just trust him. Number two, look past the present hardships to what's going to happen. Number three, we learn to praise and thank God. We don't just look past it. We thank him for it. We praise God in all trouble pain and suffering for everything happening. So hard to do. You mean I got to thank God for this cancer? Yes. Yes. I got to thank God that, that uh, your kids have disinherited you? Yes. Or dis, uh, disconnected from you. I guess you're the one who might disinherit them. But anyway, learn to praise and thank God in all things, for all things no matter how painful it might, might be at the time, no matter how difficult. I have sermons on that. Uh, that in fact, just look at my notes. I'll have a sermon in there. A sermon is called um, Thankful All the Time. Just type in Thankful All the Time and it should pop up. Or go to my notes here. I've been practicing this and I'm telling you, it helps tremendously. It does work. It's really amazing. So I'll read the verse that I'm referring to. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Thanking God in everything you're going through and for everything he puts you through. Philippians, by the way, the for everything is Ephesians 5.20. Ephesians 5.20. For everything, in everything, means everything. So Philippians 4, verses 6 to 7. Do not be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious about anything. Don't worry. Don't be upset. Don't be preoccupied with anything. <laughs> you got it? But in everything, in every situation, NIV, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, in everything, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Father, I'm in terrible pain. I'm in terrible pain. I know you know it. I know you're allowing it. I know you know I could get through it. I know this, Father, and I thank you for it because it's teaching me that even in this pain, I can come to you and trust you and thank you. But you said to let our request be made known to God. Oh, God in heaven, please help me have relief from this pain. I think of my brother, the pain he goes through, my sister. Some of you have severe pain. Bring up the pain that you'd like it to come down. Thank him in it. Thank him for it. Once you've done that, whether you feel relief or not, you thank him for it, knowing it's perfecting you. Be sure you hear my sermon on perfecting. And the peace, I think it's in the audio section right now. I'll do a video one soon. But And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When we can learn to thank God in everything, for everything, Ephesians 5.20, with 
our request presented, but we're thanking him for it, and in it, the peace of God comes on top of us. I thank you, you let my baby die. Is that crazy? No, it's not. My request now, though, is that you give me great peace in all of this, and that you give peace to my wife, that you give peace to the siblings. I thank you for that car accident. Am I crazy? No, no, no. What does in every situation, in everything, for everything mean? And then you make your request known to God in thanksgiving. And the peace is incredible. I've experienced it so much. Paul, writing this in Philippians 4, is the same Paul who in Philippi, where the Philippians lived, in Philippi was beaten with rods, put in jail, chained in stocks, probably some broken ribs, maybe a cracked skull, who knows? Probably bloodied, bruised flesh all over him, bleeding stripes on his back. Let's put it up here, Acts 16, verse 25, 26. What did Paul do? Did he say, God, wait a minute, I thought you were supposed to be there for me. Where are you? Why didn't you act? Why didn't you protect me? Why didn't you keep me from the pain and the broken bones? This, these broken ribs, they're so painful. My back is so painful. My head, my eyes. No, that's not what we read. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Now, it took them till midnight to be praying and singing. Probably were thinking, oh man, that hurts. And then finally they started singing and praising, and I'm sure some thanksgiving going on. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. Do you want doors open for you in your trial? Do you want chains loosed from you in your trial? Do what Paul did sing and praise and pray and thank God in all things, for all things. Thank God. So um, let me read that again. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, in everything, by prayer and supplication or petition, with thanksgiving, let your uh, request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will come upon you in Christ Jesus. Anyway, so that's point number three. Learn that. Learn that sermon. I have a whole sermon on it. So I hope you hear the sermon because it really, really is an important topic. It's changed my life. Preparing it and giving it and practicing it has changed my life. Still learning how to be in perfect peace, but it's getting there. Point number four. We're learning whatever happens to us physically or in this life really doesn't matter all that much anymore. Except in, in as far as, as, as what God's using the trials and things happening to us to perfect us. But our physical life, physical things, we've learned that's not what life's all about. So we have the story of Esther, for example. She realized God could do anything he wanted, but apparently wasn't doing a whole lot yet, she thought. So she and her ladies went fasting and praying for three days, after which she agreed to go petition the emperor, talk to him about this horrible plan that Mordecai, uh, not Mordecai, that uh, Agag had to wipe out all the Jews. And it was against the law to go see the emperor, the king, with, unless he called for you to come in, unless you were bidden. And, and she'd seen many people killed who hadn't remembered that law. So in her famous statement in Esther 4, verses 15 and 16, okay, then I'll, I'll fast and I'll pray, then I'm going to go see the king, unbidden. And if I die, I die. So what? I'm going to die anyway, eventually. I'm a Jew. If I die, I die. So we just learn to do the right thing. God's got this. Our lives don't matter so much in this life. God's got it. If I die, I die. If I live, I live. But Esther's actions saved the Jewish race alive in the lineage of Yeshua so that Yeshua could be born in Bethlehem later on. Satan was trying to wipe out all the Jews. So there'd be, his real intention was so there'd be no Messiah. 
because he knew the scripture said the Messiah had to come out of Bethlehem, out of Judah. So if I can wipe out Judah, there can be no Messiah, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their life was important to them. But notice what they said when Nebuchadnezzar had built this image and when the uh, orchestra all struck, you know, got started, they were, and the trumpet started, they were supposed to all bow down to it. They did not. Nebuchadnezzar warns them, you better bow down because there's this big pit full of fire in there, very hot fire. I'm going to throw you in it. it. That was his lake of fire. If you don't. And when they didn't, he made it seven times hotter. Now let's read uh, Daniel 3, verses 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, these are their, their uh, uh, Babylonian names, answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we don't have a need to answer you in this matter. We don't have to think about it. We know what we're, we know what we're going to do. If that's the case, that you'll throw me in, the, in, in your, your fire, he's saying, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. Our God is able to deliver us from what you're doing, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But notice the next verse, but if not, because they understood God sometimes, like I've been saying all along, will deliver some, like Daniel in the lion's den, and he won't deliver others. And it's whatever God wants to do. So he says God's able to and will, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. That's our example. Yes, we love our lives as much as we, as much as we do, but in the end, when it comes down to that or obeying God or not, we obey God. So this physical life, physical things in it, I've got to learn this too. Our cars, our homes, jewelry, money, TV, bank accounts, whatever, anything physical you have. Someone dings your bumper. So what? Get it fixed or don't get it fixed. It's a physical thing. I marred someone's car one time, and I was very impressed with that man's reaction to it. It's a physical thing. It's no big deal. We can get it fixed or leave it. You know, it's no big deal. And I know a lot of people, one little tiny, little dinky mag. you need a magnifying glass to see a scratch on their new Beamer. Just go, I, I knew a guy like that, He, guy I used to work with. He comes into work. Okay, who, who dinged my car out there? I need to know. And so we all went out just out of fun to see what he meant by the ding. And we're looking at it, we couldn't see a ding. Right there, right there, he was so upset. It's, uh, what was it, a 700 series Beamer. He was so upset. How upset do you get when you get your first scratch on your car? Maybe just go ahead and put a scratch on, maybe behind the bumper or something, so you get it over with. How about little scratches on your body? In the end, what happens doesn't matter that much. It's physical. It's going to go. And this is why Yeshua said if someone wants to borrow something from you, let them have it. But, you know, sometimes we, we loan things. I know I've grown in this, but Someone asked if I had a stepladder, and I did. They wanted to paint. I'd always wiped off any paint and kept my stepladder looking really clean and new looking. And I loaned it to them, and after a week or so, they brought it back to me, splattered completely with paint. I have to admit, I've grown some. I don't think I'd be that upset today. But I didn't say anything, but it did upset me. It shouldn't have. It shouldn't have. I loaned my beautiful... Uh, 270 rifle years ago to someone, not a scratch on it when I loaned it to him to go deer hunting. It came back badly scratched. I don't know how it got so badly scratched. And he didn't clean the bore either. <laughs> Again, I was in my 20s at the time. I'm in my late 60s now. I hope I've grown some. So, point number four, the physical doesn't matter that much, except towards helping us grow to be more like God and be perfected in, in the lessons God's wanting. Okay, that's number four. Physical doesn't matter. And that will really help you have, have peace. If someone's dying or in pain or bad accident or a hurricane ruined your home, it doesn't matter. In the end, in the long run, we take the long view. We add all these points together. Point number five, we've decided I won't let myself worry 
or be afraid or fear what man can do to me. I am not going to let that happen. That's what Jesus said in John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. The world gives it, not as the world gives. Let not, don't let, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That means controlling our thoughts. That means looking the long view. That means trusting God. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10, I have a sermon on this too. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Paul said he had this thorn in the flesh and he'd ask God, please, can you please take that away? And God said, you know, my grace is sufficient for you. Here it is on the screen. My strength is made perfect. My strength is made complete, made perfect in your weakness or in someone's weakness. I mean, when you're weak, it's obviously not you. And then something happens, then it's obviously what God is doing by the Spirit in you. So that's what he's saying. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon him. I'll boast in my pain and my suffering that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Are you there yet? Don't let yourself be worried. I take pleasure in infirmity, in reproaches, in weeks, in needness, in needs, I mean, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. I'm really strong in God's power, he's saying. So look at Paul's approach on this. And Paul is saying in Philippians 1, verses 23 and 24, let's put it up there while I'm talking about it. Paul is saying, you know what? I could die at any time. I could be put to death. In a way, I want to stay around and be a, be a, a, a help to all of you. But if I die, I know my next, my next waking moment, my next aware moment is going to be in the resurrection with Christ. That's what he means. It doesn't mean he's going to heaven because Yeshua said in John 3.13 that no man, John 3.13, no one, no man has ascended to heaven except Yeshua who's come down from heaven. No one's gone up. And Peter said in his sermon in Acts 2, not even David's in heaven. Not even David. It's there in Acts 2, in his sermon. So, but he was saying that either way is fine. If I die, I die. Big deal. My next moment will be, will be with Christ. So if you're being told someday in the future you're going to be tortured or you're going to be beheaded if you don't give up Christ or give up this crazy belief system you have. Just remember that. Your next moment is with Christ. And glory in it. And be strong in His strength. And look forward to the time when you're going to hear the loud shofar of the angel blazing in brightness and resurrecting you to spirit. And we're alive again with the angel, your angel, personally taking you to your husband to be Christ. So why fear what man can do to us, right? Yeshua actually even, wor uh, even told us, don't worry, a command, Matthew 6, 34. Don't worry. So that means we have to change our thinking. That means we have to analyze what are we thinking. That means we have to cast down these strongholds and bring every thought into captivity to Yeshua, to Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 and 4 says that. So let me end it with that. When you feel troubled, go back to these points. They work. Be practicing these points day in and day out. Number one, trust him, trust him, trust him, which means you got to know him, know him, know him. Pray and study like never before. A lot less time watching TV, a lot less time on, lot less time on Facebook. I'm almost off of Facebook. I just, I, I don't want to spend the time on it. Instagram, hobbies. TV, watching movies, wasting time. Now's the time to spend time with him and trust him. Number two, look beyond today to the joy set before you. Number three, learning to thank God no matter what's happening in our lives for, for the troubles and in the troubles. Number four, we've learned that physical things just don't matter that much. It's the eternity that matters. So we don't care what happens in our lives. We don't care what happens to our car, our money. If you practice these things, you'll, you'll have peace. Number five, don't let yourself be worried. Don't let yourself be worried. Cast out those thoughts. Let, like Yeshua said in John 14, 27, let not your heart be troubled. 
neither let it be afraid. I want to end with Isaiah 26, verse 3 and 4. We read it earlier. You will keep him in perfect peace. Who will keep their mind focused on you? Whose mind has stayed on you? Because, how can he stay on you? Because he trusts you. In you. Trust in Yehovah forever. For in Yah Yehovah is everlasting strength. Amen. Our glorious Father in heaven, our Abba, our, it's just amazing that we can, at any time, day or night, just say, Father, and the greatest being in the universe, here's me. And here's the people who are hearing this. When they say, Father, you're there for them. Thank you. Seated in that majestic place in heaven, 24 elders and the seraphim above you and the four living creatures around you and the, and the, the different scenery and the lightnings and all of that, the sea of glass is just amazing. Father, give us peace. Let us practice these points. I raise these people to you. They need peace. I raise the people of Afghanistan. They need peace. I raise the people we've stranded and left behind. They need peace. I raise the people to you, Father, who are going to be facing hurricanes, and one right now, Ida, coming through. They need peace. Father, your children especially need peace. They're going to be persecuted. Some of them you'll protect in a place of safety. Many of them you won't for their own need. And if the time comes that we have to give up our life for you, and Father in heaven, so be it. Christ gave his life for us, your son. And you watch that. Let it be for your love for us. So if it comes to that, let us not fail you. We also do pray and hope, obviously, that you will protect us as well, though. Put your guardian angels around your people. Watch over them, love them, take care of them. We commend this now to you. We ask for protection. We ask for the Holy Spirit to be poured down on your children as never before. We love you. We love you. We love you, Yeshua. We thank you for coming down and being our Savior, for being our life, for being our resurrection. Yeshua, beloved Yeshua, thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.